Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our final Warriors Corner presentation of the day. The topic, Supporting Force Projection from Army Installations, with presenters Major General Gavin Lawrence, SDDC CG, and Mr. Dan Riley, ASC SPO. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's, it's nice that even anybody's here at 1620 in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm just so thankful that uh, I get to sit up here with General Loris, uh, the commander of uh, SDDC. Uh, and I think it's, it's pretty interesting that uh, AMC put the two of us together up here uh, because we are going to talk about strategic power projection. Um, everything that we are doing from installations globally to project power, um, how uh, SDDC moves the force and the joint force uh, all over the planet and then some of the things that ASC does as a global command in terms of catching units on the far end uh, and then some of the things that we do with strategic enablers because we are the command that uh, provides all COSIS and issuance of Army preposition stocks globally and so it's being that one of the pieces of the strategic mobility triad uh, it's really important so we really uh, between our two commands, uh, execute uh, power projection from the fort to the port to the other port to the foxhole and beyond. And so, you know, we have, uh, if nothing else, the last several years, uh, starting back with uh, Operation Iranian Aggression through Operation Allies Welcome, which is kind of reverse of what we do in terms of power projection, uh, and then to the most recent conflict with Ukraine and the movement of forces into Europe has stretched many of our systems and taught us a lot about what it's going to look like when we start executing uh, near peer competitors in the global uh, large scale combat operations and the load that that's going to put uh, on our industrial base, on our installations, and really uh, the global transportation network. Do you have any opening comments sir, before I get started? No, uh, <laughs> Dan, I think you covered it all. I'll just say that it's uh, truly a symbiotic relationship between Army Sustainment Command and Military Surface Deployment and Distribution Command uh, as we focus on projection of combat power. And, I, and I'll get into it in a little bit, but when you talk about some of the asymmetric advantages that we have as a, our, our Army, I truly believe our ability to project combat power, to project critical combat capability to the point of need is one of the advantages that we currently have and we need to fight to maintain and sustain as we look at Army 2030, all right? And as we compete against our peer competitors. You know, the difference is, and what we're taking a hard look at, is that when we project combat power in the future, we absolutely positively believe it will be in a contested environment. And so we're partnering uh, Army Drill Command with ASC, with AMC headquarters, uh, with Department of the Army, and with the command commands to take a hard look at how do we mitigate those threats so we can continue to project combat power in support of our warfighters. Right. Dan, I'll hand it back gotcha. over to you. All right, can I get the first chart up? Um, so first, uh, as we look at uh, power projection, uh, specifically from Army Material Command, uh, and if you remember uh, a few years ago, that now means Installation Management Command, which is part of AMC, as well as Army Sustainment Command. And, and when you start at a garrison or an installation level, uh, what we look at is everything that you could possibly imagine from do we have enough barrack space uh, to do mobilization force generation installations. We have MFGIs. We have power projection platforms. Uh, that's where uh, active duty forces, Title 10, uh, think of them as the big division posts, the core posts, in the continental United States, Alaska, Hawaii, uh, where those forces are on a short string to based on the global op plan or the theater op plan that they're worried about. And they're going to deploy uh, sometimes in hours uh, out to, you know, several weeks. Uh, some of those posts at a certain point also become uh, mobilization platforms uh, for our uh, Compo 2 and Compo 3 Reserve and National Guard partners. Uh, and they start to flow in uh, almost at the tail end of where a large portion of our active duty forces deploy. Um, and so what we have to do is look at the force flow load uh, in different tip bids and what does that mean to a, an installation. Um, 
what does it look like, as I said, in terms of our ability to rapidly expand uh, as simple as defects, um, how to expand our ability to store ammunition, uh, the requirements for ranges, because many of these post camps and stations, their ranges are built for steady state and the train up of number uh, of Compo 1, but what do we need to do to rapidly uh, surge uh, capability uh, to expand that? And then it gets into everything else. How do we preposition the right stocks? And when I talk about stocks, it's everything from ammunition, operational rations, clothing, depending on the region they're going. Do they need Equix level 7? Do they need, do they need um, mosquito netting? Uh, depend on w what tip fit they're on globally. Uh, how do we stock that at installations? And then looking at our, uh, within CONUS, uh, our regional distribution hubs that we have from both Defense Logistics Agency as well as uh, our life cycle management commands. And is it wiser to keep that equipment in depots and move it rapidly? Uh, or if we start to do that, do we compete uh, with General Lawrence's strategic deployment? Because a truck is a truck and a train is a train and we have to uh, very closely manage so that we don't saturate uh, the requirements of trying to bring supplies onto a base while we're trying to move forces off. Um, one of the biggest things that we have done uh, since 2019 in partnership with Installation Management Command is you used to have a myriad of readiness reporting uh, that occurred on an installation. You had installation uh, status reports, ISRs, garrison commanders, senior commanders fill it out. It's the status of everything that has to do with the garrison. We would submit USR data and stockage data for the logistics piece, because we own now the LRCs. They used to be DOLs about a decade ago. Um, so that was all the ASPs, all of the, uh, the where you would keep class one, SSMOs, um, the CIFs. So think of everything that you would need go to war stocks, class, class forward yard, installation supply support activity for class nine. Um, and then uh, it would be within the garrison, but they would look at power projection infrastructure, railhead, roads, load ramps, facil you know, hype facilities, um, and then rail spurs going on and off the installation. But it was fragmented and, and separate reporting that uh, unless you were at a certain level, you would never get the composite or aggregated uh, view of an installation. So we have taken that down to installation level. It's all automated. It's updated every two weeks. Uh, it is certified by the senior commander, so be it the 101st Division Commander at Fort Campbell uh, or the Three Corps Commander at Fort Hood. Uh, and it, it runs the gamut of everything from facilities uh, to the ability to surge for barracks uh, to the ability to surge for mechanics and supply people and everything else that's required to do power projection. It also has all the facilities. It's also where we build, because we own the log cap contracts and the Eagle contracts for the Army, our ability to rapidly scale uh, contracts for workforce to augment across the suite of what happens on a garrison. And like I said, that is now all automated. It's classified system, but it's, we built it into SMS, which is uh, uh, owned by the Army. So that at any given time, a senior commander or really anyone, force comm commander, can pull up a power projection platform and know exactly what the shortfalls are. It also helps us inform the, uh, what's called the FIP, which is now the Facility Implement or Improvement Plan. So the Army, believe it or not, the Army has a one to n for every facility on what needs to be approved in the Army. And you can, you can scale it by power projection. You can look at it for barracks, as you heard the Secretary talk about yesterday. Um, but it helps us see ourselves so much better. Uh, and it, it was best to do it now, where we're, we're doing some pretty heavy lifting in the deployments of units, uh, but nothing compared to what large-scale combat operations are going to look like. Uh, next chart. So I, I just wanted to talk, and I'm going to really use uh, the most recent operations in Ukraine, of which we are heavily invested, both of our commands, uh, just to kind of give you where we are uh, across the spectrum of deployment. Um, so right now, as I told you, uh, constantly ongoing and has been ongoing is the assessment of our power projection platforms and MFGIs and our ability to rapidly project power in a scalable manner. Um, sometimes we don't have to execute log cap or increase contractors if you're only pushing out normal GIF map forces. But when we get into something like pushing out several armored BCTs, it, it's a different animal. Yeah. 
Um, everything we do uh, within that assessment tool is you can plug in any tip fit that's out there and look at force flow uh, per, per the installation over time, both both mobilization platform uh, population as well as the current population, and it will tell us where the gaps are. It will tell us in the gaps of supply. It will tell us, because we work very closely with the Transportation Engineering Agency, TEA, out of Transcom, and they've already done the assessment studies on how much rail we can move, how much trucks we can move, how many aircraft we can move in and out of Army airfields uh, over time and space so that we can talk to COCOM commanders and say, we, we hear what you want on your O plan, but here's the limiting factors and how are we going to get after it across the myriad of things that it takes the Army to project power off its installations. In the middle uh, is what we're doing to prepare. Once we get those assessments, um, I would say we're constantly doing EDRI and exercise. We most recently did an EDRI of 2-1 uh, ID out of Fort Riley, uh, and they, are, they were literally no notice, ABCT EDRI. They EDRI to NTC, by the way, their second one in the year, so unplanned. Uh, they went through that. We reset them for 10 days at NTC. We moved them back to Fort Raleigh, and now they're headed to Europe. And, and so a lot, if you can imagine the train movements in that, uh, we're doing train to sea movements, and I'll, I'll let right. General Lawrence talk about, you know, his best thing uh, that they do. And, uh, but that's what we do. And then for every one of these assessments, when you go out to those installations, we have what we call contracts on the shelf. So we have, we have completely done the PWS. There's always a couple of things that may change uh, that already have every one of IMCOM's requirements, every one of Forcecom's requirements, and every one of ASC's requirements already built. Uh, so it's already an established contract. It's just we haven't uh, executed the trigger. We haven't pulled the trigger because that would come with congressional uh, mobilization money. But those are in the can so that we have cut off about 60 days of ramping an installation's ability up to project power and to surge. Um, and then the, the bottom one is probably where we have made the most money in the recent <coughs> conflict, um, and that's the work that we do with Army prepositioned stocks globally. Um, so what, what we did in Europe while uh, the 1-3 came over is that was the largest issuance of apps that we just did in Europe since really we issued apps 3 uh, to, to fourth ID in 2003-4 in Iraq. So the largest issuance of apps that we've done in the last 20 years, 21 years, um, occurred this, this past winter in support uh, where we issued uh, equipment to the 82nd. We issued an entire ABCT to 1-3. Um, we also issued a number of enablers. So there were several units that, it, you know, if you ever see a heavy equipment transport company, uh, it moved in three weeks because it fell in on an entire heck company that we had already staged in Europe. So uh, APS continues to prove its worth uh, as part of the strategic mobility triad and it allows us uh, to readily uh, provide combat power very far forward. Um, and it, it's also, you know, as I get to the right, um, project power, I would say the most significant thing here, so I can turn it over to General um, Lawrence, is what we've learned is where APS is stored is probably not where we're going to issue it. Um, and so we have gotten uh, quite good at, while it may be stored in Western Europe, uh, it's issued in Eastern Europe. Um, so there's a lot of intra-theater lift execution that had to happen uh, with the 21st TSC and our, our NATO partners. Um, but we have, we have proven that APS is a huge enabler for our ability to project power. It, it's also um, a, a huge deterrence because we can move so fast uh, and we've also learned lessons that we've got to be much more agile because we're not going to issue it where it's stored, which I think was a big lesson learned from the last 24 months of operations. So that, sir, that's me. Okay. And then I'll pass it over to you and hey we'll Dan. go from there. So, so Dan did a great job setting the stage for a lot of the work that Army Material Command, in particular ASC is the lead, is doing to set conditions for the readiness of our power projection platforms to facilitate the mobilization, uh, the assembly, alert marshal, and so those platforms are ready to deploy units uh, to areas of operations. And, and what I'm going to talk about is the strategic movement piece and, and about what we do as SDDC as part of 
U.S. Transcom and Army Material Command. So let's, let's go to the next slide. So just, you know, before I get into this slide, just to give you an overview of who we are and what we do. Again, Major General Gavin Lawrence, Commanding General of Military Surface Deployment and Distribution Command. We are dual-hatted as the Army's subcomponent command to U.S. Transcom uh, and a major subordinate command of Army Material Command. You saw on Dan's first slide, and for those of you who are here for the opening remarks by our Secretary of the Army, talk to the mission and the purpose of our Army. It being to be able to deploy, fight, and win our nation's wars, right? And so I will tell you, as I stated at the beginning of my comments, the ability of our Army to project combat power is absolutely essential to us being able to do our ultimate mission as an Army, again, to deploy, fight, and win. This slide is what we call our, our DOD in motion slide, and it covers you know, the op tempo of our Army over the past two FYs, FY21 through FY22. And as you can see, uh, you know, we've been a relatively busy Army uh, <laughs> as we operate across the six combatant commands. You'll see there FY21, 22, about, about 154 BCT brigade equivalent deployments. So about 77 brigade equivalent deployments per, per fiscal year. Over 200,000 pieces of, of equipment moved. A lot of uh, reliance on commercial line trucking. On any given day, 1,500 trucks operating across our strategic highways supporting our installations. See what we're doing in terms of ammunition movements. Over 30,000 ammunition containers moved. Part of that in support of ongoing operations in UCOM as we've executed 21 presidential directive authority missions, 21 and counting. Uh, and you see in the top left corner of the slide what we've moved to date in terms of class seven uh, to assure our European allies and to deter Russian aggression in the UCOM AO. What I wanted to spend some a particular time talking about is the port missions. You see there 23 CONUS, 85 CONUS missions. And I will tell you that is a deliberate effort of SDDC in coordination with Army Material Command and our theater combatant commands to execute port diversification, all right? And we do that for a number of reasons. One, first to gain invaluable intelligence on the capability, the capacity of our ports for operations. Second, I will tell you, to demonstrate presence. You know, as we compete in today's operational environment, it is vital that we show physical presence to assure our allies and to those that will take adverse actions against our interests. And, and the third, I will tell you, and, and the ultimate reason behind this is to provide options. Options to our combatant commanders to build resiliency in our systems. I talked at the beginning of my comments, you know, being able to do this in a contested environment. And part of that is building resiliency and options for our combatant commander and choices for por ports of embarkation and debarkation of critical combat capability. And we're actively getting after that, both CONUS and OCONUS. Just this past month, we did a deliberate move utilizing a commercial po port, uh, Oakland's city port on the West Coast to demonstrate our ability to move combat power using a West Coast commercial port in support of Indo-PACOM operations. Earlier this month, we did a port visit to Denmark to demonstrate our ability to deliver critical combat capability to the high north in support of combatant operations in, in Europe. And later on this month, we'll execute a port call in the Balkans to demonstrate our ability to demonstrate in the south. Again, all about demonstrating our ability to create options, demonstrating our ability to utilize various ports to demonstrate presence in support of combatant command requirements. Let's go to the next slide. So the, the last slide I, I'll hit is, you know, how are we doing this? Uh, I already covered the, our 
mission and, and vision. And so really I want to focus on the connectors uh, and the capability and capacity uh, that we, in coordination with Army Material Command, in coordination with U.S. Transcom, we're getting after to build our ability to project combat power. And I'll start with the connectors. Uh, tasks organized under my headquarters, I have five active duty brigades, each assigned and aligned to a combatant command. And those brigades are focused on providing responsive support through their assigned personnel, uh, but a lot more through our service contracts, our stupidor and related terminal service contracts that provides coverage to facilitate upload, download of equipment, and onward, mo onward movement of equipment at ports of embarkation and disembarkation. Uh, we also you know, work with commercial industry a whole lot to ensure we have the average depth and breadth of coverage we need. You know, SDDC, we looked at ourselves as the connective tissue. Air Mobility Command, or we call AMC Blue uh, at SDDC, you know, they have planes, military sea lift command, they have the strategic sea lift, but SDDC, we see ourselves as the connective tissue, right? As uh, material comes in, connecting it from the strategic support area via coming in via mode of transportation, multiple modes of transportation, and then onward moving to the joint support area or the tactically assembled area, the point of the spear, if need be. And then I'll talk a little bit about capabilities and capacity. Assigned to my, to my command, I have about 2,600 military and D Department of Army civilians assigned to my command. A majority, a good portion of which are assigned to my headquarters. So when you think about our coverage in support of the six global combatant commands, it's not a whole lot. And so we are deeply involved and coordinated, invested in commercial capacity to augment us in terms of what we do in terms of strategic movement of units from fort to port to the joint support area. All right. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these. So trucks and highways. I alluded to the number of trucks we have moving on a daily basis to, to support our installations. Uh, in a typical fiscal year, year, we have over 300,000 truck movements that are being executed. And how do we do that? We do that through building relationships with over 700 truck carriers based here in the continental United States. So we have the capacity to support installation requirements. We have the capacity to carry critical, carry critical cargo. We have the capacity to facilitate the movement of ammunition to ports of embarkation, as we've seen in support of our, our presidential drawdown of directives. In terms of, of vessels, a strong relationship and coordination of military sea lift command to ensure we have access to commercial ocean liners. And this is an area of critical interest uh, that, that we, we have been really driving hard on to make sure that we maintain and sustain our capacity. We have, in conjunction with the Department of Transportation, uh, a voluntary inter-service, intermodal service agreement that gives us access to state-of-the-art commercial liners so that we have the ability to transport uh, critical pieces of equipment via commercial liner if a military sea lift vessel is not available to transport the equipment. And then you talk about containers. Containers are absolutely essential uh, to our ability to move unit equipment. Uh, we have programmed throughout the, the, the Palm incremental buys so we can maintain an active stock of about 300,000 containers. Mm -hmm. Working part in partner with yeah. Army Sustainment Command to make sure those are available at our installations to support units that are deploying to areas of operation. Uh, analysts and systems, Dan talked about you know, the work they're doing to ensure the readiness of our power projective platforms and alluded to the work done by our Transportation Engineering Association uh, agency to ensure uh, that we're doing assessments on our power projection capabilities, programming uh, projects yeah. to sustain and maintain those power projection platforms. And then the last thing I'll talk before we open their questions are our ammo ports. In my opinion, the, the crown jewels of what we have in terms of our ability to project uh, combat power, 
critical strategic nodes that have the ability, because of the protection, the distance, to accept large amounts of net explosive weight to facilitate onward movement of critical ammunition needed to sustain our operations. And so we are totally nested, linked at the hip with Army Sustainment Command in terms of combining our abilities to protect combat power to the point of need so we can build readiness, so we can uh, su support dynamic force employment, and so we, we can also ultimately ensure the readiness of our warfighters. Dan, I'll turn it over to you and any closing that's comments. I, I think that's really a great segue. I know we covered, I mean, an, an absolute ton uh, of information, uh, everything from our integration with Military Sea Lift Command, Air Mobility Command, um, the commercial trucking and train industry, uh, as well as Army preposition stocks, installation readiness. So it's a broad topic um, when it comes to power projection of U.S. forces globally. Uh, and I, I think uh, the best thing we could do now is one of the things we had hoped, hoped to do was not talk too much, um, but really uh, allow time for questions and answers. So um, we'll see if anybody has any questions. Hey, gentlemen, uh, Jim Kincaid, that was a great uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, clearly, there's a tremendous amount of ongoing effort required to maintain the edge, General, that you, you sir, talked about. Um, you talked about uh, great progress, but it, I think it's clear that many things need to continue off into the future. Could you talk a little bit about how AMC and the Army prioritizes projects and programs and the resources that become available to, to maintain that edge? You want to talk to go ahead. Yeah. So, so right now, there, within, at least within Army Material Command, there are, there are two huge efforts um, that are, that are uh, one, uh, the final brief is really to the AMC Commanding General. Uh, the other one is really to Army leadership at the highest levels. Uh, so there is the FIP. Uh, and that is the facility improvement plan. Um, if, if you look at how we used to do uh, facility improvements, it was prioritized at the installation level. And the senior commander had a, a great deal of flexibility uh, to prioritize uh, improvements to facilities that were really important to them in, in that particular space and time. Uh, the problem is that those got rolled up like, you know, if it was a ForceCom installation, then it got rolled up into ForceCom priorities, and then the ForceCom commanding general had to look across and, and make those prioritizations for every ForceCom installation. Uh, now, with the inception of, you know, IMCOM over the last 10 years, uh, that rolling now into AMC, we have the FIP. And so that is a Army-wide prioritization uh, facility Im improvement program where they one to end, if you can imagine every facility on every post camp and station in the Army is, uh, is prioritized on a one to end list. Uh, and then it is briefed based on operational requirements, uh, force readiness, soldier health and care, you know, and family care as we talked yesterday. Uh, and that's again briefed to the highest level of the Army. But I think the important thing is it's, it's, now, a glo it's now a global or an Army or a service look uh, a prioritization uh, by an installation by installation look where Army priorities and at yeah, the highest levels can be, you know, put onto that one to end list. The other thing that I think is in incredible is the Army does really good with the modernization of uh, green equipment. You know, look around where we are. Um, we're very good in the acquisition of green equipment, war fighting equipment. Um, but what we haven't been good on in the past is base commercial equipment. And everything that we do uh, uses base commercial equipment, be it wretches, uh, be it K-loaders, <coughs> be it, believe it or not, locomotives uh, on installations, um, DODX rail cars. And so uh, what we have done, at least in AMC, is we've come up with a uh, base commercial equipment improvement plan that also wants to end the myriad of requirements globally that the Army has for base commercial equipment. Um, in many cases, that's regional in nature because we find uh, that uh, if we're in an OCONUS location where we have uh, long-term presence, it's, it's much better to buy equipment that is readily available, base commercial in that area of the world, uh, because it comes with sustainment. It comes with you know, the mechanics or the supplies or whatever else you would need uh, to maintain that equipment and instead of trying to constantly you know, introduce US equipment into a foreign Area. When we talk about base commercial equipment, and that can be everything from a combi oven in a dining facility, 
you know, to a uh, fire truck uh, on an airfield. So th I think those are the two big things that we've done from an Army perspective to get a prioritization, especially in dwindling resource environment. Yeah, so the only thing I would add, <clears throat> and Dan hit it all, is what we've done through the FIP process <clears throat> is add um, transparency uh, and, and ensure that we have uh, a total view of requirements across our Army. As Dan alluded to, the former process, in my humble opinion, was stovepiped stove in, in, in terms of its approach. Uh, and, and so through the FIP, the FIP wargaming yeah. and the briefs at Echelon, we gain a true uh, aggregate view of our priorities in terms of uh, installation requirements yeah. and can prioritize appropriately, uh, which is essential, particularly in a resource-constrained environment. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, I think All right, it, it is it is absolutely the end of the day. So, uh well, we th we appreciate everybody listening uh and your attentiveness and your question. Um sir, just thank you so much for coming out. No. I, I appreciate everyone being here. We know we're the last presentation before the end uh, of uh day 2 of AUSA. So, we appreciate you being here and we just want you to know that Army Material Command is absolutely focused on our ability to project combat power and support of our warfighters. So thank you for being here. Thank you.